resistance was stopping my door. Because when you talk to your own self, about your own soul, as it is good for us all to do, then it is God who is speaking to you through the influence of his Holy Spirit. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? We wonder if David uh, did not know the reason for his depression and discouragement. Well, that sometimes happens. People may be cast down and yet not know the reason why. In that moving Negro spiritual, which was so well sung a moment ago, nobody knows the trouble I've had. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've had. Nobody knows but Jesus. Sometimes I'm up. Sometimes I'm down. Yes, Lord, even low on the ground. The other man we know, or he knew, or thought he knew, the ground for his discouragement and low spirit when he lay beneath that juniper tree or hid in that cave there on the barren side of Mount Sinai. Discouragement is a very common thing. I run across a lot of people who from time to time and for different reasons may be discouraged. And yet, it's not a safe state of mind to be in because it uh, breaks down the defenses of the soul and leaves you open to attack on every side. If Satan could be stripped of all the temptations with which he assails the souls of men and yet were left in possession of this one, that would be sufficient for him. The medieval theologians and preachers have talked a great deal about the seven deadly sins. And these in their estimates were anger and avarice and envy and gluttony and pride and sensuality and then what they called sloth, not meaning as the word suggests to us today laziness, but depression and discouragement. Now at first that strikes you as strange, I suppose, that discouragement should be listed among the sins and especially among the deadly sins. But since it is due to a lack of faith in God, it certainly is, if not resisted, and overcome a sin. What doest thou here, Elijah? A study of the discouragement of Elijah is, and the cure of it, is one of the best antidotes for low spirits and those discouragements which from time to time come upon our souls. Here across the pathless desert in that barren south country there comes a solitary man wearily dragging his feet over the sand. The very embodiment and picture of dejection and depression. He flings himself down under this shrubber tree, the juniper tree, and as he does so, a groan escapes his lips. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life. Who is this man? 
is it the vow Elijah, the great prophet of God, whom a little ago we saw standing in splendid triumph over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? Is it thou, almost the greatest and grandest man of the Old Testament, and of all the men of the Old Testament, one of the two with Moses, called out of the unseen world to stand yonder on the Mount of Transfiguration and speak with Christ and encourage him as he looked forward to the climax of his work of redemption upon the cross. Yes, it is Elijah. And that strikes you as strange at first. Elijah comes upon the stage of Israel's history by a crash of thunder. No introduction. Nothing about his history up to that time. Till we see him standing there before the wicked Ahab and his queen. And saying, as the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be neither rain nor dew on the earth, except at my word. And then after he was hid from the wrath of the king in that remote valley, the next time we see him, he's standing there on Mount Carmel, defying the 450 prophets of Baal, invoking God after the prophets of Baal had prayed in vain, invoking God to open the heavens and send down fire to consume his offering and his altar. And when that was done, and he had slain the prophets of Baal, then he went further up on the mountain top and prayed to God that the three years and a half drought would come to an end. And presently, there was the sound of the abundance of rain. And girding up his loins, Elijah ran like a conqueror before the chariot of the king back to the palace at Jezreel. What a moving, triumphant scene that is. And yet, here he is. O oh Lord, it is enough. Take away my life. What had happened? When Jezebel learned of the fate of her prophet, this ferocious woman sent a message to Elijah. The Lord do so to me and more also. If I make not thee as they are, by this time tomorrow. And Elijah fled for his life, clear down to Beersheba. And in that desert place, he fell down under that juniper tree. And then again, still further to the south, to the barren slopes of Mount Sinai. His spirit had suffered for a little, Eclipse. And if we study his situation for a moment and the cure that God gave him, it ought to do us good at any time of low spirit or depression. Uh, first of all, his discouragement, no doubt, was due in part to physical conditions. There must have been a great physical reaction to that tremendous scene yonder on the slopes of Carmel. Then he had traversed almost 200 miles in his flight to the south, and most of the time, I suppose, without food or drink, and his body was spent and weak. Satan is a good psychologist. He knows when and where to strike. When did he tempt Jesus? 
He came to him after the end of the 40 days fast. And when his whole human nature was crying out for food, it was then that he said to him, command that these stones be made bread. We talk a great deal about the influence of the mind over the body. Well, that can be overdone. The body also has great influence over the mind. And here we see an example of it in the distress of Elijah. As we shall see later on, in this condition, Elijah arrived at uh, conclusions which were altogether wrong and false. And that's quite common. The great physicist Tyndale had a depression of the chest. And he said that whenever that came upon him, he was careful to discount and dismiss the opinions and verdicts at which he arrived. The mariner shoots the sun, as they say, and shoots the stars, not when they are obscured and hidden by clouds, but when they are visible. And so we ought to do on the voyage of life. Now let us see what God did for him. First of all, he ministered to his body. He gave him food. The angel touched him and said, Awake, arise. And when he sat up, he saw cakes on the toes and a cruise of water. And he ate and drank took the nourishment that is necessary for the body and then lay down to sleep. What a beautiful ministry sleep is to the troubled mind and the troubled body. Macbeth didn't know the blessing of innocent sleep until he had murdered sleep. sleep that lift up the rattled sleeve of care. The, ba the balm of hurt mind, sore labors back, death of each day's life, peace nourisher at life's feet, blessed sleep. The other cause of Elijah's distress, one of them, was the hostility and implacable hatred of this wicked woman. After his noble service to God and to the people of God, I suppose it seems strange to Elijah that he had to be subjected to this trial and this affliction. And it sank his spirit hostility, unkindness, unfriendliness, unkind criticism, depress the soul. There's no doubt about that. And now and then people have to say what the Savior said, quoting the psalmist, they hated me without a cause. If you ever come to a pass like that, then remember it's a blessed thing to have that great friend who loves you without a cause. That is no reason in you why Christ should love us, but he does. He loves us without a cause. Still another reason for this discouragement of Elijah is loneliness. Now that's strange too. Because Elijah was grandly alone when he defied the king and the queen in their court. And grandly alone, too, when he stood there on Mount Carmel, confronting the 450 prophets of Baal. You would think that here's a man who will not be troubled by any loneliness of spirit. That of all men, 
He is the man who won't need the entire book or company of other men. And yet no such man ever existed. And Elijah was a man of like passion, as James says, with you and me. And he needed encouragement in his loneliness. Now, it was a sort of noble loneliness. It's one thing to be lonely and disappointed in your own personal plans and ambitions and hopes. Quite another thing to be lonely or disappointed in your work for the kingdom of God. He knew that disappointment. There was another great man who knew it. The one whom Jesus called the Elijah of the New Testament, John the Baptist. He too who stood before a wicked king, Herod Antipas, and his paramour, and said to Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And he too, like Elijah, knew the ferocious hatred and vengeance of a wicked woman who asked for and at length received the head of John the Baptist on his charges. But before he was slain, down in that lonely dungeon in the fortress of Matyris by the Dead Sea, John began to wonder about his preparations for the Messiah and what he had said about this one, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. For a moment his eagle eye was filled with doubt and his mighty spirit began to flag and he sent to Jesus that message out of the dungeon, Art thou he that should come or look we for another? And so it was with Elijah. Well, God showed Elijah that he was mistaken. He said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And Elijah answered quite confidently, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. But thy people have broken thy covenant and overthrown thine offers and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Why shouldn't I be down? Why shouldn't I be here in the desert? But God showed him he was mistaken. He said to him, Elijah, you're wrong. I have yet 7,000 left in Israel. And that 7,000, sort of a mystical number, seven in the Bible, indicating a great number, 7,000 knees that have not bowed to Baal and lips that have not kissed him. Whenever you get discouraged about the slow progress of the church and of the kingdom of God, remember Elijah and those 7,000. God always has his reserved battalion. Workmen of God, oh, lose not heart. But learn what God is like. And in the darkest battlefield, thou shalt know where to strike. Christ blessed is he to whom is given the instinct that can tell that God is on the battlefield when he is most invisible. The last part of Elijah's cure was when God told him to go to work. You can't do anything for me under this juniper tree or here in this desolate cave on the slopes of Sinai. So, anoint Jehu king over Israel and Haziel king over Syria and Elisha to be thy successor. I think I can see 
Elijah riding forth now to write another great chapter in his history. The old fire in his eye, the old courage in his heart. Once again, Elijah the Tishbite, the prophet of Jehovah. If you get down sometimes, that's one way to get cured. Go out and do something for somebody else. The sweet English poet, Kebo, once said that if you're assailed by despondency, then go out and do a kind act to someone else. And I think it works. It will lift you out of discouragement and lift others out of discouragement too. And that's a blessed ministry. There was a time in David's life when he was down and discouraged. When he was pursued by the ferocious hatred of King Saul and was hiding in that hole away in the south country and Saul with his army pursuing him and in the night at the risk of his own life Jonathan the son of Saul passed through the lines of Saul's army and found David in that hole where he was hiding and strengthened it is written his hand in the Lord. David was evidently discouraged and perhaps losing faith somewhat in the promise of God that he was to be king. But Jonathan strengthened his hand in the Lord and said to him, Fear not, for thou shalt be king, and I shall be next unto thee. America owes a great debt of gratitude to the brilliant General William Tecumseh Sherman for his military history. But one of the greatest things he ever did for the Union was when he persuaded the discouraged Grant not to give up his command. After the great victory of Shiloh, on the Tennessee, the commander-in-chief of all the western country, General Halleck, pitched his tent with the army of the Tennessee, and Grant became just a figurehead. Halleck ignored him completely, and his situation became so intolerable that he resolved to leave the army, and he was packing his effects at his headquarters when Chairman happened to ride over to see him and asked him what he was going to do. And when he told him, he pled with him to reconsider and said to him, I was once in a situation like yours. Now everything is bright with me. You hold on. And some happy event will come along which will change things for you as it did for me. And Grant promised him that he would reconsider. At least he would not leave the army until he let Sherman know. And in a short time, the happy event happened. General Halleck was called to Washington as the supreme commander. And Grant was left to run his own army and march straight forward to his tremendous victory. The word of encouragement in season. When you get discouraged sometimes, it's good to remember other people who have been in the same situation. I was leafing through a book in my library, The Life of William Cowper by Golden Smith. And I came upon a passage, a sentence that I'd marked when I read it a good many years ago. It was this, let him who is assailed by despondency read this passage and remember that the man who went through that experience lived to write John Gilpin's Ride and the Task. Then I looked back to see what the passage was. It was 
the story of that chapter in Cowper's life when he received an appointment as a clerk in the House of Lords. But immediately he conjured up great fears as to the examination and as to the hostility of the Lord until his mind was unbalanced. First he tried to take his life with laudanum and then he planned to go to France and change his religion and bury himself in a monastery. And then he took a cab and went down to the Thames, intending to cast himself into the river, but something held him back. And the night before he was to take this examination, he lay for hours in his bed with the point of a knife resting against his heart, but could not command the resolution to drive his home. And then he tried to hang himself, but the rope with which he was suspended broke. Now that's the man who lived to write John Gilpin's rise and the task and still more the man who lived to write God moved in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the star. Ye fearful saints Fresh courage tape. The clouds be so much spread are big with kindness and will break with mercy on your head. The worst kind of discouragement, of course, is the discouragement that comes out of moral failure and sin. The tempter when he persuades any of us to do evil, tells us, you know, it doesn't matter. Who cares? And then when you have done evil, he says just the reverse. He says it matters so much that now you belong to me. In vain your repentance, your resolution, what you have written, you have written. Thank God that is not what Christ says. See how he dealt with Peter after his terrible transgression. All that he said to him was, Peter, lovest thou me? Then feed my sheep. And what he says to everyone who is cast down by evil, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let us pray. Bless, O oh God, this message which comes to us from the great prophets and thy gracious dealing with him and the sweet singer of Israel who said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the strength of my life. Help us all so to do. We ask it in Jesus' name.